In the early 2000s, the video game industry was at a crossroads. With every passing console generation, games were getting closer and closer to mainstream success. At the time, it was the sixth generation of home consoles, which was populated by the Sega Dreamcast, Nintendo GameCube, Microsoft Xbox, and Sony PlayStation 2. With games and systems flying off the shelves in record numbers, Charles Hershorn was looking to capitalize on this new ground. Hershorn was the president of Disney Animation and noticed not only the popularity in gaming, but in the drastic increase in the quality of graphics from even a few years before. At the time, there were no television channels that focused solely on video games. There was Tech TV, which started back in 1998 as ZDTV, but that was more about technology than just games. There were also websites like Sudo.com that had the All Games Network channel, but in order to watch those shows on players larger than the size of a postage stamp, you needed a broadband connection, something most people in the U.S. didn't have then. After visiting the trade show E3 for the first time, Hershorn decided to create a channel that focused on both games and game culture. He saw how passionate the people at E3 were about games, and thought they would naturally gravitate to a channel that was aimed directly at them. He saw the potential, as well as dollar signs, in this untapped market. The idea was to make a channel that would appeal to the teenage demographic, the ones with lots of money and tons of free time. With this new frontier, it would bring in advertisers eager to get their product in front of millions of potential customers. Hershorn wanted the channel to be like the early days of MTV, when the channel had a rebellious attitude and an almost underground feel. Gamers were intrigued with the idea of an all-gaming channel, and on April 24, 2002, G4, TV for Gamers, launched. G4 was owned by the cable company Comcast, and with their deep pockets, they spent a fair amount of money trying to get the word out about it. For the first week, they ran a non-stop marathon of Pong. After that, they went into their lineup of original game-oriented programming. There was Arena, hosted by Will Wheaton and Travis Oates, which was a show that focused on multiplayer competition. Blister, hosted by Bill Sindelar, was a show about action and adventure games. Blister was also the first show to air after the Pong Marathon. Chi was a show dedicated to cheats, tips, and tricks for popular games. It was hosted by Corey Rouse. Cinematech would show cutscenes, trailers, and cinematics for video games. The show had no host, and it was just a non-stop 30-minute block of game footage. Filter was a top 10 list show about numerous game-related topics. They had episodes like Best Music Game, Most Controversial Games, and Best Cutscenes. The show was hosted by actress Diane Mazzotta. Game On was a show where hosts Randy Kagan and Matt Gallant would travel across the country to pick people off the street and challenge them to compete with others in their selection of games. G4TV.com was a video game talk show hosted by Laura Foy, Tina Wood, and Scott Rubin. Each week they would discuss a different topic in the game community and would often have industry folks in the studio for interviews. As a way to make the show interactive, they would set up calls with people from the G4 forums to discuss the topic of the week. Two of the hosts had come from Pseudo.com, Laura Foy and Scott Rubin. Laura was the co-host on Judge Cal's High Weirdness, a show about bizarre videos they either found or that people sent them. Scott Rubin started the All Games Network in 1996, which was hosted on Pseudo's game channel. Icons was a show done documentary style about different iconic figures in the gaming industry. From fictional characters like Lara Croft and Pac-Man, to industry innovators like Shigeru Miyamoto and Will Wright. Judgment Day was a video game review show hosted by Victor Lucas and Tommy Tallarico. In the mid-90s, Lucas created a series called The Electric Playground, where they reviewed everything from movies to gear to comics. A segment within the show called Reviews on the Run was picked up by G4 and turned into Judgment Day. Tommy Tallarico is an award-winning industry veteran and music composer. He was a driving force behind improving the quality of video game music. In 1993, he did the soundtrack for The Terminator on the Sega CD. In it, he's playing the electric guitar, which was the first time that had ever been done in a video game. This is just one of the innovations he's responsible for. In Judgment Day, they had a brief section where they would review hardware. The segment's noteworthy for having Evangeline Lilly as one of the hardware girls very early in her career. She would leave the show to be in the hugely successful show Lost. Portal was a comedy drama about MMOs hosted by Dave Meinstein. By using what is commonly known as machinima, the show did various skits and segments with video game characters as the actors. Players was a show about celebrities who play video games. Pulse was a news show about the gaming industry. Hosted by Patrick Clark and Ronnie Lynn Riley, this was a weekly recap in the world of video games. 
Sweat was a show strictly about sports games, and finally Starcade, which was reruns of the old arcade show from the 1980s. The channel was off to a promising start. Gamers liked the fact that there was a channel specifically dedicated to something that for many was more than just a hobby. They enjoyed the somewhat cheesy but genuine feel of the shows. Since a nice group of the hosts actually worked in the industry, the audience identified with them since they knew what they were talking about. Gamers flocked to the G4 message boards to talk about their favorite games, their favorite shows on the network, and developed a strong community. Many of the show's hosts visited the forums and helped to make things feel more interactive. In November of 2002, with the launch of Xbox Live, many of the hosts would give out their gamer tags and would frequently set up times to play with their fans. Return to Castle Wolfenstein, Mech Assault, and Rainbow Six were popular choices for the community. The channel ran 24-7, and with only a handful of shows, there were tons of reruns. At the time, the channel was only reaching 15 million homes. And that's not 15 million viewers, that's 15 million homes that had the channel in their cable list. With such a small reach, they were having trouble attracting advertisers. As such, the slots they had allocated for commercials were filled with humorous bumpers, video game world records, and celebrity station IDs. To try to bring in more advertisers, Hershorn made offers to have commercials run during the shows disguised as part of the program. They offered to have games presented as special features in shows like G4TV.com and Pulse. One of their more successful marketing endeavors was to get Pringles to sponsor one of their shows. And so Cheat became Cheat, Pringles Gamer's Guide. They had some buy-in from game companies and stores like EB Games, but it wasn't enough to offset the cost of running the channel. In 2002, they started their yearly coverage of E3. Meanwhile, in late 2002, trouble was brewing on the set of Arena. One day, seemingly from out of nowhere, Travis Oates and Will Wheaton quit the show. Fans asked what happened, and Wheaton wrote a lengthy blog post about it. In the post, he spoke about how he, Oates, and the crew were constantly mistreated by an incompetent producer. The producer shirked most of his responsibilities, and because of this, the show suffered. The producer was in charge of bringing new players in, but only paid them in pizza, and often kept them waiting for hours before finally getting to play. Word spread amongst the local gaming community of the mistreatment, and people stopped showing up. They needed someone to play, so the producer filled the empty spots with G4 employees and interns. After numerous altercations with the producer, Wheaton and Oates quit. The network replaced them with Lee Rareman, an ex-American gladiator, and television actor Michael Loudon. While still angry over the departure of the original hosts, the fans eventually accepted Rareman, but never warmed up to Loudon. The producers of Arena fired Loudon and brought in Kevin Pereira. Pereira was a G4 forum member by the name of Captain Immy that was hired early on by G4 as a production assistant for G4TV.com. He did some of the writing for the show, as well as scheduled calls with the audience. He also briefly worked on Pulse, after Ronnie Lynn Riley left. Starting in 2003, they had G4ia, a heavily marketed video game award show. They tried to make it a legitimate show, but with awards like Alt Sports Award powered by Mountain Dew, EB Gamer's Choice Award, and Best Stride Longest Lasting Game, it was difficult. Still, it was a fairly large event, and that did bring in the advertisers, so it wasn't all bad. The channel plugged along happily for two years. Some shows like Game On were cancelled, while others grew in popularity. Unfortunately, there just wasn't enough interest at the time. People were watching, just not enough for more cable networks to pick up the channel. Cable channels need to have a reach of at least 40 million homes before advertisers would show interest, and G4 couldn't seem to get past 15. The growth of G4 was too slow for Comcast, so they took drastic measures to keep it alive. There arose an opportunity to buy Tech TV and merge it with G4. Paul Allen, the owner of Tech TV, put it up for sale, and G4 purchased it. The main reason for this was G4 would inherit Tech TV's slot on Direct TV, which would open them up to about 50 to 60 million homes. Tech TV fans were none too happy because they felt G4 was in this for the wrong reasons and would ruin Tech TV. On May 28, 2004, the channel relaunched as G4 Tech TV. While the merger is what saved G4 from being taken off the air, all it really did was lengthen the process. Comcast closed the Tech TV studio in San Francisco, laid off numerous employees, and relocated the rest to their LA studios. G4 kept the higher profile shows like the Screensavers and X-Play, but canceled most everything else. They even took this opportunity to clean house on some of their own shows. They canceled Portal, Arena, Pulse, Players, Starcade, and Blister as a way to restructure the channel. Since Tech TV had the Electric Playground, they figured having Judgment Day and EP were redundant, so they canceled Judgment Day. G4 no longer wanted the channel to be TV for gamers, so they changed the slogan to Stay Connected. 
To fit within the new generic tech lifestyle, Filter changed from top 10 video game lists to more lists about concerts, TV, and movies. Pringles under their sponsorship, and Cheat, Pringles Gamer's Guide, reverted back to just Cheat. X-Play was already a favorite amongst tech TV fans, and quickly became a favorite with G4 viewers. Hosted by Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb, the show mixed game reviews with goofy comedy segments. The Screensavers was a show about computers and technology. They had interviews, viewer calls, and answered many tech-related questions. When they moved to G4, they moved away from computers and technology, and the show became more about pop culture. As the year progressed, it became clearer about what was going on. More tech TV folks were being laid off, and the few remaining TV shows, with the exception of the screensavers and X-Play, were cancelled. Tech TV fans were furious. In February of 2005, only 10 months after the merger, they dropped the Tech TV tag altogether and reverted back to just being G4. With Arena cancelled, Pereira took over hosting duties on the screensavers since the G4 producers fired almost the entire cast. Dan Huerd, one of the guys who worked on the screensavers, spoke out about the show after G4 let him go. He explained that while on the screensavers, they took live calls from the audience to answer tech questions. When G4 took over, they no longer wanted to take live questions. The calls would now be pre-produced. He said, Management didn't want geeks asking questions on our show anymore, despite the fact that they were the intended audience. He would record the Q&A segments ahead of time, and they would air the ones approved by the producers. This was similar to what G4TV.com did when they were still on. They would search the forums for topics they wanted to bring to the show. They would then contact the person who posted it, and would set up a time to call them. They would record the segment, edit it appropriately, and air it at a later time. During this time, Scott Rubin left G4 to host Gamehead on Spike TV, as well as to restart all games as its own website. He was replaced by Jeff Keighley, a video game journalist. G4 changed their slogan again, this time to the very generic sounding, Video Game TV. Later in 2005, Hershorn announced he'd no longer be in charge of the channel, and Neil Tiles took over as president of G4. He previously worked at DirecTV, Fox Sports, and ESPN. He announced the network would be retooled as a mail-oriented channel, much like Spike TV. Moving further away from gaming, they canceled G4TV.com. Laura and Tina both left to go work at Microsoft, and Keeley returned to writing and working behind the scenes at G4. They also canceled Filter and Sweat. As a way to appeal to the more male demographic, they let Corey Rouse go from Cheat and brought in Kristen Holt, a semi-finalist in the first season of American Idol. Continuing to distance themselves from tech TV, they revamped the screensavers and it became Attack of the Show, which I still feel was a name they got by randomly pulling words out of a hat. Attack of the Show was a live show that was a mixture of pop culture, comedy routines, news, and tech reviews. Essentially, it was the revamp the screensavers with a new name. Pereira stayed on, but all the other co-hosts left. They looked for a permanent co-host, and discovered actress Olivia Munn. The chemistry between her and Pereira was a lot of what kept the viewers tuning in. Well, that, and also because she would do things like this. And this. Tommy Tallarico started the very successful Video Games Live concert series, and since it started taking up much of his time, he was on Electric Playground less and less, until finally leaving the show altogether. In 2006, just four years after the launch of the channel, it barely resembled its former self. There was a new president, a hostile merger, and almost all the launch shows were either cancelled or retooled. They brought back Filter with a new host, Beth Ostreski, a model and wife of radio personality Howard Stern. The show now only did lists about pop culture. It didn't last and was cancelled again a few months later. Icons was cancelled as well, leaving Cinematech as the only original lineup show still on the air. In 2007, they changed the slogan again to TV That's Plugged In. Now that they cleared out almost all their original content, they picked up numerous shows for syndication. Cops, Cheaters, and Ninja Warrior to name a few. They ran Cops and Cheaters marathons so much, it turned off many of what would have been their audience. This was around the time when most of the remaining core audience jumped ship. A lot of them ignored the channel, but still frequented the message boards. In order to try to keep at least some aspects of gaming on G4, they expanded their annual E3 footage by covering the Microsoft press conference. The problem was, no one thought about the spots for commercial breaks, so fans watching it live saw the first ever look at the Mass Effect trailer cut off by a commercial. On top of that, due to FCC regulations, they had to do a station ID at midnight, which cut off the end of the Microsoft conference. That just so happened to be where they unveiled Halo 3 for the first time. It was a disaster. Continuing their attempts to appeal to the young male demographic, they started airing things like the not so subtly named Midnight Spank, a block of programming that ran more adult content like Ed the Sox Night Party 
and G4's Late Night Peep Show. During this block, they did a variation of Cinematech called Nocturnal Emissions, where they showed sexually suggestive cutscenes and weird game footage, mostly from Japanese titles. Over the next few years, they tried to create some original programming in the form of animated shows. Happy Tree Friends, the intentionally cute, overly violent show, Spaceballs the Animated Series, and the crude 8-bit style comedy, Code Monkeys. Out of the three, Code Monkeys was the only one to actually get some traction, but still lasted just two seasons. They spent ridiculous amounts of money to secure the syndication rights to shows like Heroes and Lost instead of creating new original programming. Cinematech, the last original program from G4, was cancelled in April of 2007. Ironically now, years after the G4 Tech TV merger, all the G4 shows were gone, and the two most popular programs on the platform were X-Play and Attack of the Show. Further downgrading G4, they closed their Santa Monica studio, and the people who weren't laid off were moved to the LA facility. X-Play, being one of the most popular shows, had a new set built. They got rid of the relaxed atmosphere of the old set, and went for this weird futuristic style with glass balls balls glued to the floor. With the popularity of X-Play growing, they redid the studio yet again less than a year later and changed the format of the show. They removed the comedy segments and now claim they had brutally honest game reviews. They also dedicated some time on the show to do interviews and game news. The show was expanded to run five nights a week. Cheat was cancelled and became a segment within X-Play, with Kristen Holt giving game tips a few times a week. A little over a year later, the show was dialed back to three nights a week and more people were laid off. It seemed they were stuck. No matter what they did, the channel just wasn't growing. Less and less people were watching the shows, so cable networks started dropping the channel due to low viewership. 2010 was a major blow for G4. In November, DirecTV removed them from their channel lineup. So all the work they did in absorbing tech TV, firing everyone, and constantly searching for an identity for the channel, it all finally caught up with them. Ultimately, they ended up ruining two networks. Olivia Munn left Attack of the Show in order to pursue her acting career. She was replaced by another actress, Candace Bailey. In 2010, G-Foria was absorbed into X-Play as part of their year in review. In 2012, they redid the X-Play studio yet again. Adam Sessler had friends within G-4 telling him that they'd heard rumors that he was going to be let go in April. One day while filming an episode, he was told the vice president of production wanted to meet with him in his dressing room. Toward the end of the episode, he noticed the VP off-camera, and he knew that he was fired. After his firing, he got a job working for Revision 3, a company founded by many of the people who had been fired by G4. Morgan stayed on X-Play, and Blair Herter, a former MTV personality, replaced Adam Sessler. In early 2012, Tiles stepped down as the president, and the job went to Adam Stotsky, a marketing chief for NBC. Stotsky began meeting with the owners of Esquire magazine to rebrand the channel as the Esquire Network. The deal fell through, and the Style Network ended up becoming Esquire. In May, Pereira announced he'd be leaving G4 to work full-time on his production company, Super Creative. After Pereira left, the ratings tanked. In October of 2012, G4 announced the last two original programs, X-Play and Attack of the Show, would cease production before the end of the year. Attack of the Show had a rotating cast of hosts for the final months. They filmed the last episode in December and aired it on January 23rd, 2013, the same day as the last episode of X-Play. Morgan Webb's now a creative advisor for Activision Blizzard, and Blair Herter's working for DC Comics. With the end of the last two original shows, the channel simply went through the motions by running nothing but syndicated shows and reruns of old content. Now the channel's been dropped from almost every cable network, and the syndication rights of their shows have lapsed. G4 continuously suffered from an identity crisis. They got rid of almost all their video game-related content, despite the fact that X-Play, a show that reviewed video games, was one of their most popular programs. Their yearly coverage of E3 was also a consistent hit with the audience. Still, it seemed like they shunned video games despite being the only thing that really consistently worked. No one was making an effort to tune in for reruns of Campus PD or Human Wrecking Balls, and yet they insisted on bringing in more and more syndicated programming. I know there's a lot of disdain for G4, and I get why. For thousands of tech TV fans, they had their programs gutted, also what they considered a lesser channel could get more exposure, which sadly is exactly what happened. They can at least take solace in the irony that the last two shows to survive were X-Play and Attack of the Show, and nothing from the original G4 lineup made it past 2007. G4 didn't realize the goldmine they were sitting on. When Neil Tiles spoke about retooling the channel, he stated that it was because gamers like to play games, but not necessarily watch a bunch of shows with games on the screen. 
With the rise of Let's Plays and the overwhelming success of Twitch TV, that shows just how wrong that statement was. I think the biggest problem was that they were still thinking in terms of traditional TV. They should have had more shows like Arena, with a better mix of games, and not crammed into 30 minute segments. They could have had 2-3 to three hour Friday night game blocks, where the game played would be sponsored by the game company. You think EA or Activision wouldn't have jumped at having a 3 hour weekly spot to advertise their games? The review shows, news shows, and even the technology variety shows, like Attack of the Show, were fine. There was no need to get rid of them. I have no idea why they cancelled shows like G4 TV.com. What better way to keep the audience tuned in than with a show that spoke directly to them? It was a way to interact directly with the audience, and I can't imagine it costing that much to produce. I realized there was a lot of time to fill, but why not have things like StarCraft tournaments, or even classic game blocks and live speedruns? This was the first all-gaming TV channel, and they filled it with reruns of Fastlane. If they wanted to venture outside of video games, they could have stayed within the geek realm, with Magic the Gathering and Pokemon tournaments. How about every Saturday night at midnight they run an all-night D&D campaign? Perhaps have one to two hours for board games? Was the channel doomed to fail? Before leaving Attack of the Show, Kevin Pereira had an interview with former president and creator of G4, Charles Hirschhorn. He lamented the sloppy takeover of Tech TV, and said if he could do it over again, he would have done it in a way to not alienate both audiences. He also explained how he came up with a name for the channel. And I had this idea for a channel, and I just sort of screamed to my wife, Cynthia, I said, I need a name for this channel, just go online and buy a URL. <laughs> and, she said, and she said, great. And I said, anything video game channel works. Just find anything. Sure. And um, they were all taken. So we'll just start with V or G or something. Find something. And she said, all right. She said, G4 is available. I said, buy that one. To me, he seemed like somebody who saw the potential in a video game channel, but wasn't really interested in games. He just wanted to capitalize on them. The thing is... That's okay. Almost everything that you have was created by someone with the intention of making money. Hershorn did a good job of bringing in people with industry experience, but should have taken more time to brainstorm with them about what the channel needed before the launch. When things got bad, they should have looked for input, rather than just firing everyone and format swapping. The potential was there, gaming was only getting bigger, and they should have worked harder to find ways to appeal to that audience. Instead, after the merger, they got rid of what made them unique and turned into a bad version of every other channel. Channel. I love the first two years of G4, warts and all. It was amateurish, but it had an amazing charm to it. My friends and I were constantly quoting the bumpers, and honestly, we still do. It was a hot summer afternoon, and I was just out of the shower. I turned on my PS2, my VCR, and bang, I hit the million points on my first run. I was shaking like crazy and unable to play after that for a couple of hours. It was pretty insane. The concept of the channel was for a new revenue stream, but the hosts, writers, and staff that worked behind the scenes were trying to make something special. Their hearts were in the right place, but they were constantly hampered by the people in charge. From idiotic, short-sighted, foul-tempered producers, to upper management who didn't see the value in what they had. G4, or TV for Gamers, was something special, but now it's seen as an oddity. A failed experiment in getting games on television. Dun, dun. I just want to remind you, I have a Patreon set up. Uh, if you like the show and would like to help keep me going, even a dollar a month would make a difference. I would really appreciate it. I've got some cool rewards set up, so check it out. Thanks a lot.